We are now in the second part of this lecture, which is about Newton's method. And uh, last time we saw gradient descent, so we start with some initial point x0, and then we move to the next point x1 by going into the direction of the gradient at, uh, at this point. And uh, we use line search to uh, guarantee convergence by not overstepping, by not walking uphill on the other side of, of the valley, quote-unquote, um, and uh, we get some additional performance improvement by doing this line search. Uh, still, here in this example, it takes about 130 steps to get to the solution down to a sufficiently small epsilon that was, that was predefined. But uh, keep this number in mind. Here it took 130 steps to get close enough to the, to the minimizer. The idea behind gradient behind Newton's method is um, that we not only want to walk downhill, we also want to find a point where the gradient is zero. So if you if you look here, if you are exactly downhill, then in a very local region around the minimizer, the gradient will be exactly zero. And um, this is the case if we have an unconstrained target function. So if the target function here goes from r to r uh, to the power of n to r, and um, uh, if it is unconstrained, then it is, uh, and if it is strictly convex, then we know that it has a single global minimum. So there's only one point where the minimum is achieved. And uh, if the function is strictly concave, then we know there's a single global maximum. If it's neither of them, then there can be also locations where the gradient is exactly zero, which would be here, this saddle point in the middle, but which is not a minimum or a maximum. But if we assume convexity, then we know that the minimizer must exist and that at the position of the minimizer, the gradient will be exactly zero. If uh, there, there are additional constraints, so if we have to say that the, that the solution has to lie in a certain region of, um, uh, of a subset of R to n, then uh, it is no longer the case that at the minimizer the gradient will be zero, but here we are still unconstrained and therefore uh, this is something that uh, is always holding true in these unconstrained and convex optimization problems. Now, if we are looking for a point where a function becomes zero, um, um, this is uh, something that uh, people hundreds of years ago have already thought about, and uh, the canonical method to do so is Newton's method. So this is also called root finding. So for a function to find exactly where it is intersecting with the abscissa and uh, where the function becomes zero. And uh, what Newton's method does, it is also an, um, um, an iterative method, is uh, to start at some initial location and then do a sequence of steps that brings you closer and closer to, to the root. And um, what happens here is uh, we start at some original point zero. And for this function here, uh, this is actually uh, for finding the root of two. So we have here the function x squared minus 2, and uh, at the position where this function is 0, we have exactly x equals the root of 2. And uh, we want to get closer and closer to the root of 2. Um, so what is done? We are at the place x0. We have f of x0, so the height of the function at that point. And then we take... Uh, then we linearize the function around this point. And here we have the gradient uh, going down. And um, now we take the intersection of the gradient, or of the subgradient at, at this point, uh, the intersection of the subgradient uh, with the abscissa, and select this as the location of the next point we will evaluate. And this is repeated and repeated until we get really close to the actual root. And uh, 
since here we have linearized or we have taken the, the subgradient um, doing the, the computation of finding here the intersection with the abscissa for the subgradient, this can be done really fast. And um, how can this be computed? So the subgradient will be here um, f of x plus the gradient times the step that was uh, that we did away from the point that was um, selected in this iteration. So here x, x is fixed, so x is the point where we are evaluating and the y is um, the new location on the subgradient where we want to evaluate the uh, well, the value of the subgradient at this point. So here we have f of x, this is constant, this is the point that, uh, that was selected, plus the gradient times the distance from, um, from uh, the original point x. Um, and uh, we want this to be zero. And now we can uh, switch around, we can move the uh, grad uh, fx uh, times y over to the other side and uh, simplify a little bit and we get back this expression. So the next point that we are selecting where the subgradient becomes zero, so this epsilon is selected as f of x minus f of x divided by the gradient f at x. And then we do this iteratively, so up here you see how this is performed iteratively and uh, quite fast we will get to the location where, uh, where the root or in this case, uh, the, the square root of 2 is located. Newton's method can also diverge, but uh, for today we will ignore that part. Um, in, in most cases, Newton's method will converge rapidly. We will later have a, a bit better characterization of how fast Newton's method can converge. And now what we do is we apply Newton's method to find the place where the derivative of the function that we want to minimize is zero. So we know that in the location where, where the minimizer is, the gradient is zero. And now we use Newton's method to get close to this point. And um, the formula you saw on the preceding slide is now a little bit more complicated. So now here we have taken the inverse of the Hessian at the current point. On the next slide we will see exactly where this is coming from. So here we have the original point minus the Hessian at that point, um, the in, taking the inverse of that Hessian times the gradient at that point. And again, this d here, it gives us a, a, a direction in which to step and we can further refine the step size by uh, applying the, the line search on, on that step direction. And in general, Newton's method requires a lot fewer iterations than gradient descent. So originally we had 130 steps we had to take to get here to uh, close to the minimizer. And with Newton's method, it took us exactly one step. And um, so we are 130 times faster. However, each iteration is now a little bit more expensive because we have to evaluate the, the Hessian uh, and we have to invert the Hessian and uh, in large dimensional pr problems this quickly becomes computationally difficult. So um, uh, for this low dimensional problem um, it is always better, better to directly use Newton's method and for very high dimensional problems where we can no longer easy, easily compute the inverse of the Hessian um, there it becomes interesting to, to look at alternative methods, but uh, uh, if that wasn't a problem, then Newton's method is, is what would be uh, preferable. Okay, how, where is this Newton's method coming from? How is this motivated? We saw uh, before that uh, for finding the square root of 2, we were taking the subgradient and uh, here this is no longer the case. Here, um, first of all, we take the, the second degree Taylor expansion of uh, the target function that we are looking at. So here we have our target function f and uh, we select our initial starting point x0 and now we do a Taylor expansion 
at this point. So this is the point. And the Taylor expansion, we saw that last week already, consists of um, the position or the, uh, the value of the function at that point. Um, then we add to that the subgradient. And in addition to that, we are adding the Hessian uh, and uh, uh, times the, the distance um, transposed in front and uh, the distance at the end. And uh, so what this tele expansion has as a property is that uh, its first and second derivative are exactly the first and second derivative of the function f at this location x0. And um, so this is a, a quite good, or in many cases, quite good approximation of the underlying f. And what the Newton method does here is in every location to find, uh, because we are now no longer trying to find where this is intersecting with the abscissa, we are looking now for the location where the, the gradient of the Taylor expansion becomes zero. And um, so here we have selected now the location where the Taylor expansion, where the gradient of the Taylor expansion is zero. Select this new point, do a new Taylor expansion around that point, uh, select a point where um, the gradient is zero, and so on and so on. And uh, quite rapidly again we will converge to the point where the gradient of the original function f is zero, and this is exactly our minimizer. And uh, here's the, the derivation. So uh, there's um, one step that is a little bit more complicated uh, to compute the gradient of this tail expansion. Here it's tau of x at the location uh, z. And um, um, to get to this gradient, uh, you have to recall that the Hessian is symmetric. And then it should be quite straightforward to get uh, from this expression to, to the gradient. And now we expect this gradient to be exactly zero. Now here equal to a vector of zero. And then by applying the appropriate linear, linear algebra transformation and uh, multiplying this expression here with uh, the uh, inverse uh, Hessian um, and, do, uh, and add the inverse Hessian on the left hand side of, of both sides of the expression, uh, we get to our uh, step for the Newton method. So how to get from our original location to the, to the new location uh, where we are closer to the minimizer. There is a, um, a body of work that has looked into the convergence speed of the Newton method. And uh, there is one very important uh, theorem by Kantorowicz uh, who proved in the late 40s uh, the superconvergence of the Newton theorem. So Kantorovich, he's interesting. Uh, he was a uh, renowned uh, Russian mathematician and he was also behind a lot of the effort in Russia to centrally plan the economy. And the methods he developed and the optimization tools he developed were famously used for, for central planning of uh, capacity and uh, which resources to invest where and so on. Uh, but he, um, uh, well, not only had this role in the state, uh, but uh, before that he was already, uh, he produced some quite important results in mathematics. And one of this is the superconvergence of Newton's method. So here we say that um, our f is assumed to be twice differentiable uh, with uh, Rn as the, as the domain. So uh, we can compute the Hessian at, at every location. And uh, if this Hessian is positive definite, so uh, if it's, the function is, is, is upwards bent, so to speak, um, and if we can bound the, the curvature or uh, how, how fast the, the, uh, the, the gradient of the function changes, um, and if we can bound that with some number, this is called the Lipschitz uh, number, um, and uh, if we are close enough to the initial guess, then we can show, or he showed, that uh, there is a superconvergence to the minimizer. And uh, the convergence is of a runtime of the order of log log 1 over epsilon. So epsilon here is the remaining error that is still allowed. 
and uh, log log 1 over epsilon is really good convergence because if we reduce the error by times 1000 in many cases this only increases the number of newton step newton method iterations uh, that we need to take by 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 one or or maybe two so um, due to this super convergence if our initial location is close enough to the minimizer then by only two or three iterations of the newton method we will be as precise as we can still um, represent the solution in our uh, floating point numbers on, on our computer. But however, we need to be close enough initially uh, to, to achieve the superconvergence. So uh, you can think of this like a bassin of superconvergence. So here we have our, our minimizer and there's this bassin of superconvergence around that. And if we, if we find our way into the bassin of superconvergence, then the Newton method in just a few steps will, will converge to the minimizer.